Hey, we all know the world of real estate is rapidly changing, especially right now. It's crucial to stay ahead of the curve and adapt to new regulations and strategies. And that's exactly what we're diving into today in our latest video. Now, recently, the real estate community has been buzzing all about the NAR settlement and the significant shifts that it's predicted to bring into the industry. But it's not just that about understanding these rules, all the changes, it's about mastering the new rules and continue to thrive under these new rules. So in this video, we're honored to feature Robert Palmer. He's the CEO of LPT Realty, who will share his insights and strategies on navigating these changes successfully because this isn't his first time. This isn't just about fearing the new landscape, but it's actually about embracing it with the right tools and the right mindset. So whether you're a buyer's agent that's concerned about the future or looking to shift more towards a listing focus for your business, this discussion is tailored just for you. We understand this is a lot of stuff and information to take in. There's a lot of confusion and concern out there regarding the settlement and what it means for real estate agents. Now, Robert will break down the essential aspects of the buyer broker agreement system and introduce some powerful tools that buyer's agents can use, providing you with the knowledge to differentiate yourself in this new environment. So stay tuned and explore how to leverage these changes to your advantage. This is going to ensure that you're not just surviving, but thriving in the ever-evolving real estate industry. Looking forward to jumping right in with you. Thanks for taking the journey with us. Hi, you and Lewis want to uh, kind of set this up and then we'll jump into to my uh, my analysis of the 108-page the settlement. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one thing that I, one, when this news broke on Friday, we were on Real Estate First Friday. Yeah, that was actually pretty uh, funny. We were sitting there and our phones are blowing up as fireworks awesome. are happening yeah. in, in the midst of Real Estate First Friday. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so we actually took a, a quick break uh, from, from Real Estate First Friday just it to address and say, hey, guys, we will be addressing this on uh, Motivational Monday with you guys. But, you know, one thing I think to, to kind of get everyone in the, the right frame of mind to think about, the, to absorb this information is that things are always changing. We knew when we launched this company that we were at the point where the industry was kind of kind of broken, not just necessarily one piece of it, but like the, the agent interaction with the brokerage was kind of broken, that was fragmented. And so we knew that there was gonna be some type of change coming in, and that was some timing of the strategic launch of LPT Realty. But as we think about this, change is scary, right? Like it, it's scary. Anytime that you have to do a new process or adopt a new thing, or, you know, there's the, it's, it's uncomfortable. And we all know that. Uh, but through that uncomfortableness, you have the opportunity to grow, you have the opportunity to adapt. And so while it is somewhat of an obstacle for some, there will be people who innovate and get right past it and they will take their unfair share advantage of, of the marketplace. And so we're going to walk you through today kind of what is actually in the settlement. There's a lot of headlines out there. If you guys have seen on CNN where it's like the Realtor Commission is dying, you know, there's all these inflammatory headlines that are really trying to, you know, they're clickbaitish, right? That, and, but that's what the consumer is going to be seeing. And so us with inside of the industry have to be experts on what is happening so that we can educate the people that we serve on what's actually changing and then you guys can navigate your business more efficiently. So, uh, like we said, we walked through the entire 108 page proposed settlement. Uh, we've got Lewis here, who is a real estate attorney, who will give us his, his take on it and kind of walk us through where we are in the process of what's going to happen. Uh, and then we've got Robert, who's going to give us the details in terms of when he's gone through this in the past, when this change in previous industries, how he navigated and thrived based on those changes and embracing those changes. So um, with no ado, with further, no further, no ado, Robert, I'll turn yeah. it over to you to, to walk us through um, kind of what's happening with the settlement and what the details really are uh, that are changing. Cool. Well, I, I've prepared another slide deck since this is a, uh, a complicated topic. So if we can get those slides back up on y'all's side of the studio, yeah. uh, we can go on to the next slide and, and we'll kind of break down, I would say, the, the truth of what's going on here. And, you know, obviously we've seen um, seen the big headlines come out. You know, National Association of Realtors reaches the agreement to resolve the claims. I will say overall, having the claims resolved is positive. Um, you know, seeing all these different lawsuits pop up around the country, you know, this is something that was really causing uncertainty in our industry. And obviously, it's it's important that we know where we're going. All right. And so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, it just kind of, you know, this next slide just shows some of the headlines that I'm sure you've all seen. These are the things that we now have to be prepared to deal with. Uh, because again, the, the media is taking this and spinning it in a way uh, that isn't necessarily representative of of what's happening and what's in the actual settlement document. 
Uh, and so again, today we're breaking down, we're going to show you language from the actual proposed settlement and, and talk about how I do think there's some changes. Like it's, it's not going to be business as usual. Uh, I don't see this as being catastrophic. I don't see this as dropping commissions by 40, 50%, as some of the headlines are saying, but there are going to be changes that we have to adapt to. And, and I see opportunities for agents who are willing to adapt and embrace and, and really take advantage of the new ways this creates for you to serve your clients uh, because that does exist. So let's let's go on to the next slide. Um, so the, the key terms of the settlement, um, one, NAR announced the agreement that would end litigation of claims brought on behalf of home sellers related to broker commissions. The settlement is still subject to court approval. Uh, although at this point, the parties have agreed, and it seems like most of the points in here would lead to a court approval. Uh, if you look at the, the Department of Justice's objections to the MLS pen settlement, which held that settlement up in one of the other cases, most of those points were all covered here. So it seems like NAR worked with the Department of Justice to make sure they were okay with this before making their big announcements. Uh, NAR continues to deny any wrongdoing, of course, and then NAR is going to pay $418 million over approximately four years. Um, if you think about the number of NAR members there are and the amount of reserves and cash that NAR currently has, this may may result in a small increase in dues, but it, it doesn't have to be anything overly dramatic in order for NAR to hit that number. Uh, next slide. Uh, two critical achievements. This is from NAR's press release, the release of most NAR members and many industry stakeholders from the liability, and the cooperative compensation remains a choice for consumers when buying or selling a home. And that, that was important for NAR. Again, while I think a lot of the system changes make cooperative compensation less attractive, and we're gonna talk about why that is, it is still a choice for consumers and for agents. And so really it's going to give us, I think, again, more ways to serve our clients, more ways to negotiate our own commissions on both sides of the transaction. And uh, so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so, the release of liability, this is an interesting one. So who was actually included in this settlement if it's approved? Uh, NAR was included, over 1 million NAR members and most brokerages, not all brokerages, uh, all state, territorial, and local realtor associations, and all associations owned by MLSs. So the exception is uh, brokerages whose residential transaction volume in 2022 was above $2 billion must make an additional payment of 0 0.0025 times the average annual volume over the last four years, or they have to enter into what's referred to as hardship negotiations via mediation. Um, to give you some perspective, if you take Compass's four-year volume times the 0 0.0025, that number is around half a billion dollars. Um, if you take EXP's volume times the 0 0.0025, that number is like just a little under 400 million, like 360, 370 million dollars. So the the largest brokerages still have uh, still have to deal with this. They still have to decide: Are they going to opt into the settlement and pay the 0 0.0025? Are they going to go to this mediation and say, "Hey, we don't have that much money"? You know, companies can say, "We don't have half a billion dollars to pay you." Look at our financials. This is what we do have. Uh, my gut says that, that the plaintiff's counsel is going to say, hey, you're a publicly traded company, issue more stock, go raise some debt, figure out how to pay us. But we really don't know what that looks like. According to NAR's press release, they fought hard trying to get all brokerages included. But in the end, the plaintiff's counsel was unwilling to release basically what ended up being the top 100 brokerages in the country. And if you do the math on that 0 0.0025, if a company's average volume was around the 2 billion mark, which was the threshold, you're looking at $5 million for them to, to add into the settlement, again, up to as much as $500 million. So there's still a lot of money in question here beyond the 400 million that NAR is paying. Uh, and then too, there, I think there's gonna be some ripples inside of the industry and NAR, because the these brokerages were basically not included in the global settlement. Uh, and so again, we're, we're going to be watching that closely. Uh, you know, roughly a third of the money goes to the attorneys, and then the rest is spread between all of the uh, consumers who opt into the class action settlement. So, you know, you've probably gotten a class action notification in the past, you'll get a little postcard in the mail that says, hey, you know, you're a part of this settlement because you sold a home during the last four years. Here's your check for $50, $40, whatever that number ends up being, depending on how many brokerages actually settle in the end. Um, going on to the next slide. 
So when I really read through everything, there are effectively three really big changes that that we need to consider as a brokerage and we all need to consider as agents. Uh, number one being that cooperative commission is no longer required. It remains optional. It can no longer be advertised in any MLS fields or any third party system using MLS data. And I'm actually gonna show you the actual language from the settlement. This is my interpretation on this slide. We'll get into the actual language behind it. Uh, and so this is big, you know, the fact that it remains optional is important. The fact that it's no longer required is interesting. It's going to change the way we do business or allow us if we choose to, for agents to change the way they do business. The fact that it can no longer be advertised in any MLS fields. I know on social media this weekend, people were saying, oh, well, we'll add it to this field or that field. Uh, I believe they, you know, basic on um, based on a, a clear interpretation or a, a kind of a strict interpretation. Even uploading a document, which is still considered a field of the MLS, may be a violation. And then two, there was a lot of talk of like, well, some other system will become the system of record for this. There is actually a, a clause that says if MLS finds out that any system using MLS data, like showing time, is trying to become the new. A uh, place for buyer's agent commission to be advertised, they have to cut them off. So we'll, we'll go into that a little bit deeper. Uh, number two, all realtors and MLS participants must have a buyer broker agreement executed prior to any touring. All right. So before the first tour, you have to have a buyer broker agreement signed. This is massive. Um, this is probably one of the most impactful changes. And I think this is actually going to be good for buyer's agents in the end because everyone has to do it, including the listing agent. We'll talk about what that looks like. So everyone now has a level playing field to get that buyer broker agreement signed up front. And here's the important one. The final compensation cannot exceed what is agreed to in the buyer broker agreement. So if your buyer broker agreement is signed at 2%, and then you sell a house where the listing agent is still offering cooperative compensation at say 3%, you do not get the extra point. That extra 1% has to be repaid back to the consumer because you cannot make more than what was in your, your agreed to buyer broker agreement. You cannot go up if the seller is willing to pay you more. So that's an interesting kind of twist. Uh, and then three, since all commission amounts are now negotiated with each party prior to the offer. So think about that. I've used this word of decoupling commissions I had some people challenge me on that and say they don't see this as decoupling commissions. Whatever commission you negotiate with your buyer as a buyer's agent is the commission you will receive. So again, if you negotiate a 2% commission with your buyer's agent and then you sell a house that's offering 3% cooperative commission, you still only get two. So the commissions have absolutely been decoupled. You have to negotiate your buyer commission with the buyer's uh, agent or with the buyer. And then the listing agent is going to negotiate the listing commission with the seller. And then yes, the seller can absolutely agree to help pay the buyer's agent's commission, but they can't pay more than what was agreed to in the buyer broker agreement. And that that's critical, that's important to understand. So again, since all commission amounts are now negotiated already with each party, the good thing here is the amount of seller contribution to buyer commission can now be negotiated in the actual purchase contract. And again, this is a big shift from where we sit today. If you represent a buyer and you don't have a buyer broker agreement and that buyer falls in love with a house that's only offering, say, a 1% buyer's agent commission, then that's what you're going to make. Under this new set of rules, you're going to have already entered into a buyer broker agreement with your buyer before the first tour outlining your compensation. And now you need to negotiate, is the seller going to pay that? Is the buyer going to pay that? And that can be negotiated at the time of the actual contract. All right, let's go on to the next slide. I think probably put maybe spotlight the slides, Davey, so we can focus on those. Um, we're going to go into the, the backup, the detail behind. Um, can you spotlight? If, yeah, there we go. We'll get them back to full screen for you guys. All right. So this is actual language from the settlement. So again, I just gave you my summary. We're going to go back to my summary. But first, I want to take you through the actual um, settlement language. And then we'll get back into how I think this looks for business going forward. Uh, these are the things that that are required to be changed as uh, as practices as if the settlement is approved by the courts. Eliminate any requirement by the MLS that listing brokers or sellers must make offers of cooperating compensation to brokers or other buy representatives. So mandatory compensation is gone, still optional. Eliminate and prohibit any requirements conditioning MLS participation or membership in offering or accepting compensation. So this is the first thing. The settlement is saying no more mandatory offers of compensation and bullets I and IV from the settlement cover those. Next slide. Uh, 
prohibit MLS participants, subscribers, or other real estate brokers, other real estate agents, or sellers from making offers of compensation on the MLS to cooperating brokers or other buyer representatives. All right, so this is what's saying you cannot list the buyer agent compensation or the total amount of compensation in the MLS anymore. All right, and it says now the second bullet down there eliminate all broker compensation fields on the MLS and prohibit the sharing of offers to buyer brokers or other buyer representatives uh, in any field of the MLS. So this is what's gonna prohibit people from using private remarks, public remarks, no matter what the field is called, the chat, Davey. No matter what the field is called, it can no longer have any offers of compensation or talk about compensation. So these two bullets are what actually puts that into practice. Uh, next slide is one more. The next slide is where they're actually going to prohibit third-party companies. So the MLSs have to agree that they will not create, facilitate, or support any other mechanism from becoming the place where internet aggregators, showing time, or anyone like that uses MLS data and then adds in the uh, cooperative broker compensation. So they really tried to go through and, and make sure there were no loopholes here from the standpoint of getting compensation offers into the MLS or into any third party services like showing time. Uh, this would, in my opinion, would prevent Zillow from being able to show compensation on listings. I know there was a lot of information going around about that um, on the internet. This V here, uh, item five, from the change in behavior from the settlement is going to prevent that from happening. The MLS have to make sure that no one is using their data to create a, an alternative way to offer compensation. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the big one. Require that all MLS participants working with a buyer into, into a written agreement before the buyer tours any home. All right, so now think about this. Even if you're the listing agent, you cannot tour the buyer on that home if you're ever going to make compensation from them without getting a buyer broker agreement signed up front. So everyone has to deal with this now. So if you think about it in today's world, uh, if you ask for a buyer broker agreement, maybe the buyer just calls around until they find an agent who is willing to show them a house without a buyer broker agreement. Now, every single agent before touring, before the first tour of any home, they have to have a buyer broker agreement signed. So again, this levels the playing field. Now, the, the consumer can call a million agents. They're going to have to commit to someone before they can tour a house. So I, I see this as an actual win for buyer's agents. So uh, if you're going to receive compensation from any source, the agreement must specify and conspicuously disclose the amount or rate of compensation it will receive and how the amount will be determined. B, the amount of compensation reflected must be objectively ascertainable and may not be open-ended. You can't write buyer broker compensation shall be whatever amount the seller is offering to the buyer. You have to have an actual percentage or it could be a percentage plus a flat fee. So you could say 2% plus $500, 4% plus $1,000, but you can't say whatever they're willing to pay me on the sell on the sell side. So again, they really wrote this trying to close the loopholes to provide a new way uh, for this to happen. Uh, and then C, MLS participants may not receive compensation for brokerage services from any source that exceeds the amount or rate agreed to in the agreement with the buyer. So whatever that number you agree to with the buyer, if you find a listing that's offering a 10% commission, you can't make that 10% uh, because of what you agreed to with your buyer. The other interesting thing here, and we're going to see how the final rules are written, it says from any source, so our other sources, like maybe maybe you you recommend a home warranty company and make some money there. Maybe you recommend an alarm system company and make some money there. We don't know until the final rules are written if, if those types of compensation will be limited as well to the maximum amount that was set in that buyer broker agreement. So again, this is the actual language from the settlement talking about the buyer broker agreement and, and how that's going to play out now in the future. There is still obviously some things to be determined in the rulemaking by NAR, but this is what the settlement actually says when it comes to the buyer broker agreement. And the big things here are before the first tour, that's massive, not just before closing, not just before writing an offer, before for touring, if you're ever going to make compensation from them, right? Uh, and then from there, we go into it has to be objectively ascertainable. You can't write whatever they offer me on the sell side is what I'm going to take. Uh, and then you can't make more than whatever was agreed to in that original buyer broker agreement. So those are three big shifts. Even for states that have mandatory buyer broker agreements today, this is a change. This is a shift for most states. They don't have this stringent of a buyer broker framework. Uh, so moving on to the, the next slide. And uh, maybe go back up full screen. And then uh, this is this one's not super long, but 
uh, NAR has to rescind or modify any existing rules that are inconsistent with the practice changes reflected in paragraph 68 of the settlement. So policies like Article 1616, will we need to be rescinded or modified since commissions have already been negotiated and there is no longer a mandatory cooperative compensation. So for those of you that don't know, the reason you cannot uh, negotiate commission in a contract today is because of this uh, standard of practice 1616. This is a clear example of one that will have to be modified or rescinded under the new framework because there is no longer mandatory buyer agent compensation, which is again, going to create a situation where agents negotiate a commission with the listing agent, a commission with the buyer's agent. And then the final negotiation is, will the seller be helping pay any of the buyer's agent's commission? So it really is three negotiations, right? Listing agent negotiates the listing uh, commission. The listing agree agent can choose to pre-negotiate a contribution to the buyer's agent. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. And then the buyer's agent negotiating the commission with their buyer at the time of the buyer broker agreement. Right? And I have not seen any language that says you can't reduce your commission, only that you can't increase it. So if your initial buyer broker agreement is signed at 4% and you end up only getting two because the buyer is short class of funds, whatever, that's okay. On the flip side, again, from what we see today, on the flip side, if your buyer broker agreement is signed at two and then someone's offering four or five, the extra uh, is not going to be able to go to you under the rules and the way they're written, All right? Next slide. <clears throat> oh, next one, there we go. So again, the three big changes. And again, I'm gonna keep going back to this slide as we go through the presentation. So. Again, I showed you the actual backup, the actual language from the settlement. These are my three bullets of how those changes all come together. Cooperative commissions no longer required, remain optional, can no longer be advertised in any MLS field or third-party system. All realtors and MLS participants must have that buyer broker agreement subject to very strict rules executed prior to touring. And the final compensation cannot exceed what's in the BBA. And now that commissions are already set, the amount of seller contribution to buyer commission will be negotiated separately at the time of the purchase contract or potentially pre-negotiated by the listing agent. But I actually think that can cause some problems and we're going to talk about why. So on the next slide, uh, I want you to ask, uh, I want you to ask yourself this question. So with all of these changes, the big question is, while it's still an option, should you pre-negotiate a cooperative commission with your seller? If you're a listing agent, under the new rules, right? In today's world, you absolutely have to negotiate both your commission and the cooperative agent commission at the initial listing appointment. That is how it works today. Is that the best method moving forward? It is still an option. And again, as entrepreneurs here at LPT, this is your choice to make, but I'm gonna tell you my views on it. And, and so what you need to think about is, does it make sense to pre-negotiate that commission when one, you can no longer effectively advertise in the MLS, so other agents aren't going to know what it is to motivate them or not motivate them. The amount listed in the buyer broker agreement will limit what you can make regardless of what is offered. So regardless of what you as the listing agent offer, whatever's in that buyer broker agreement is going to be the max that the buyer's agent can make. So you may have 10 different offers come in with 10 different potential commission rates if the buyers have negotiated different amounts. But if you've pre-negotiated a commission, does that still make sense? And then now that your seller actually has the power to decide any seller contribution to buyer's agent commission on a case by case basis for each contract. I want you to think about how powerful this is. This actually gives, in my opinion, agents more, more uh, flexibility in how deals are put together. Instead of pre-negotiating a commission, the seller would now have the choice to look at the commission in each different offer and decide which offer is best, which offer is highest and best. And that's not always going to hinge on the commission rate. Next slide. So the seller experience, I kind of just alluded to this. There's basically two ways as agents you can think about this. The listing agent can pre-negotiate a total commission. You can go on that listing appointment and say, you know what, Mr. Seller, 6% commission, three for me, three for them, 8% commission, four for me, four for them, whatever it is, very similar to today's situation. Or the listing agent can make a choice to negotiate only the listing side of the commission at the listing appointment, but then prepare the seller that there will be requests to contribute to buyer's agent commission in the future. I want you to think about how that negotiation goes. Hey, Mr. Seller, all I'm gonna do today is have you agree to pay me as your listing agent two, two and a half, three, four, five, seven, whatever that percentage is. But I do want you to be prepared 
that when the offers start to come in, some of those offers are going to ask for us to contribute to the buyer's agent's commission. And together, you and I are going to look at each one of those offers, and we're going to make a decision for the one that is best for you. Which one sounds like a more powerful position to come from? If agent A goes in saying, hey, give me 6%, and whatever an agent B goes in and says, hey, commit to three today, and then we're gonna see what the other side asks for as the offers come in, I think there's an opportunity here for agents who choose to embrace the new framework to have a competitive advantage over other agents. Now, again, we're not saying don't pay buyer's agents, right? A buyer agent agreement may come in asking for 10% commission. We don't know what it is, but the key is you're going to make that choice with your seller as the offers actually come in instead of pre-negotiating the commission the way we do today. Now, guess what else that does? When the seller says, hey, Robert, I just saw a CNN headline that said real estate commissions are no longer 6%. You can say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm only asking you to sign for 3% today. Now, we don't know how much we're going to have to pay the other side. We'll find out as the offers come in, maybe it's still 6%, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 7%. I don't know. But yes, at, at today's signing with me, before the change, I would have asked you to sign a commission agreement for 6%. Today, I'm only asking you to sign a commission agreement for 3%. And then we're going to determine the other side's commission as the actual offers come in. To me, that is a much more powerful position to put yourself and your client in as a real estate agent. Next slide. All right, so let, let's look at two examples of this. So you list a home with a $450,000 asking price and you do not pre-negotiate the buyer's agent commission. This is option two. Two offers come in. The first offer is $450,000 and that buyer signed an agreement for 4% commission with their agent and the agent is now asking your seller to pay the entire 4%. Your seller would net $432,000. A second offer comes in at $430,000, and that buyer signed a buyer agreement at only 2%. And again, they're asking your seller to pay the commission. Offer one nets your seller more money. Had you pre-tried to sell your seller on the commission, you probably wouldn't have landed at 4%. You probably wouldn't have landed where you are. But now you can look at each offer individually and determine what's best for the seller. Let's look at on the next slide that same scenario with a pre-negotiated commission. So now you have a pre-negotiated commission. You said, you know what, Mr. Seller, I'm going to do it the old school way. You're going to go ahead and sign today with me for 6%, 3% to me, 3% in cooperative commission. We can't advertise that. We can't tell people about it. But when offers come in, just be prepared for that. And now our same two offers come in. So now on offer one, you have to have, which is actually the better offer, you have to have a tough conversation with your seller and say, well, I know I told you I thought it was going to be 6%, 3% for me, 3% for the, the other agent, but this agent's asking for 4%. So we're going to have to do an excess credit to pay the difference in buyer's agent commission, but you're still going to net 432000 On the other offer that comes in that's only asking for 2%, because you pre-negotiated 3% to that agent, and that agent can't keep the difference because their buyer broker agreement is only for 2%, the buyer is actually going to get the $4,300 back as some type of rebate, which is then potentially going to cause problems with their lender because that may be an excess concession. So again, there's a lot of things to think about here where while the old way is still an option, all right? And again, I'm not telling you how to run your business at LPT. We will support you no matter with which methods you choose, as long as they're state compliant and legal. I just see where the old way is going to cause some problems because now that buyers are negotiating the commission at the time of the buyer's uh, broker agreement, if that is lower than what you pre-negotiate, you actually are hurting your seller. And if it's higher than what you pre-negotiated, now you've got an awkward conversation with your seller. So again, I think over time, we're going to see less and less agents pre-negotiating that commission. Now you absolutely need to prepare your seller for it. You need to tell your seller, hey, this 3% you're paying me, that's not the end of the day. There is going to be most likely some other commission you're going to participate in. But the idea of pre-negotiating that and trying to do a co-op commission and then trying to find a way to communicate that out or worse, taking a thousand phone calls from buyer's agents saying, how much is the pre-negotiated commission? How much is the pre-negotiated commission? Since you can't advertise it in MLS, I think over time, the old way is going to get less and less popular and you're going to see more agents embracing the framework uh, of kind of how this was built and what this now opens up. Uh, next slide. So impacts of the settlement. This is important. 
Um, Fizbos and builders, and I've seen a lot of questions about this in the chat, and I wanted to wait till we got here to talk about it. So Fizbos and builders, one, they've already shown us how markets will behave because Fizbos and builders never had mandatory cooperative commission. They, they never had all of the things that are now being eliminated, and you always had to negotiate any commission contribution from the Fizbo at the the time of offer and then builders were going to put out their numbers and maybe some builders pay higher some builders pay lower depending on market conditions i want you to think about a world where all buyers are under a buyer broker agreement that should say buyer broker agreement not bac sorry wrong wrong acronym there every buyer is under a buyer broker agreement and so if all these these buyers are already under a buyer broker agreement because they've already started touring houses to me that's going to take away some of the builders power to suddenly slash commissions in a hot market. Because if all if all of the consumers are already under a buyer broker agreement at a certain percentage, the builder is going to have to either turn those people away, tell them to come out of their own pocket, or they're going to have to continue to pay what is in line or contribute what is in line to help those buyers pay the commission. So I think that the buyer broker agreement existence is actually going to help agents when it comes to working with builders and obviously with FISBOs, because you're going to see more of those uh, proliferate around the industry. The other interesting thing now is agents have this new power to negotiate the seller contribution to buyer agent commissions at the time of offer. That's probably one of the most powerful things that's coming from all this because you already negotiated the commission with your buyer now you are free as a part of the contract to negotiate how much the seller is going to contribute to help pay for that because you're not negotiating the commission the commission's already been negotiated with your buyer and even if the listing agent pre-negotiated a commission for you that's irrelevant because you negotiated the commission with your buyer at the time of the buyer broker agreement so again these dynamics are changing as much as people want to say nothing's changing these are changes now you can do business the old way i don't see this i'm not a sky is falling guy i see opportunity here and i really want to encourage our agents to take a hard look at do you want to embrace this or do you want to keep doing it the old way again lpt is going to support you either way but i wanted to share our perspective so next slide All right, so when someone does call you and say, hey, how much is the co-op commission? Because this is going to happen, right? It's no longer in the MLS. You're going to have buyer's agents calling listing agents saying, how much is the co-op commission? How much is the co-op commission? If you pre-negotiated a co-op commission, you're going to say, oh, it's 2%. Oh, it's 3%. Maybe you scare some offers off, right? You say, oh, it's 2%. And that guy says, well, my buyer broker is for three. You know, maybe that's not going to work for my buyer. My recommended response to you is, my seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission, please submit with your offer. You're not turning any way, not, not turning anyone away. You're not presetting any type of commission levels. You're not discouraging agents who maybe do have a higher buyer broker agreement. You're literally telling them, hey, submit your offer. Tell me how much you want. I'll present it to my seller. And again, make sure your seller is willing to entertain all requests. Maybe some won't be. My gut says most will because they want the highest and best offer they can get. But this is how I would explain it. My seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission. Please submit with your offer. And my hope is that we can actually put that language in the MLS. We're not sure yet. The way the rules are written, it's ambiguous. My hope will be that we can put this in the MLS because this is not an offer of compensation. This is a willingness to accept requests for compensation. So again, my hope is they let us put this in the MLS, but if they don't let us put it in the MLS, when you answer your phone and someone says, how much is the cooperative commission on this house? You say, basically, whatever you need it to be. My seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission, Please submit with your offer. This will get the most offers in the door. This will give you the best opportunity to work with those sellers. And again, this is some of what I view as the power of this new decoupled system. Next slide. And we, we will share this deck with everyone. We'll put it into connect. All right, so the, the power of the new buyer broker agreement. To see a house, you will have to sign a buyer agreement with someone. Right, Any realtor, any MLS participant, before they can start touring homes from you, if they ever hope to make a penny off of you before the first home tour, has to have you sign a buyer broker agreement. Even the listing agent, because they are most likely an MLS participant or realtor, you may see some like open doors or people who purposely leave NAR membership uh, because they don't need the MLS and maybe they don't want to have to comply with this, but most people are going to uh, comply with this and most people are going to have to get that i mean when i say most i'm saying 98 percent of all business is now going to be done with a buyer broker agreement 
To me, this gives the buyer's agents more control over negotiating compensation than today's system. Again, today, if you don't have a buyer broker agreement and you go to a house that is paying a low commission or no commission, you're kind of stuck. In the new world, because you can negotiate your commission rate up front with your buyers, you're going to have more power. The other thing is it's going to kick out a lot of the looky loos. If someone is just trying to use you to show them a house because they plan on writing the offer with their brother-in-law or their friend or whatever, they got to sign a buyer broker agreement with you now before they can get in the house. You're going to know that consumers are actually committed to you. You may set a threshold and you say, you know what, for my business, I, I don't have time to work with any buyer who won't pay me a 4% buyer agent commission. And you get to make that choice up front and put it into your buyer's agent agreement. And maybe there's some, maybe there's some consumers who say, Hey, I'm going to go shop for the best deal. Great. Find that out up front before you waste your time, putting them in, in your car and driving them all over the place. This is going to give you more control of running a stable business as a buyer's agent. All right, next slide. So now when it does come time for this contribution to buyer's agent commission, right? So you have a buyer broker agreement. Let's say it's hypothetically signed at 3%. Oh, need to go back a slide. We skipped one there. Um, you have a buyer broker agreement signed at 3%. And now it's time to ask the seller to pay that commission for you so that your first time home buyer or your buyer doesn't have to. Uh, the way I think about it, there's basically two methods to do this. One, I, and these are both terms I made up. One is what I'm calling the direct commission payment method. And this is where I would say, I would think you would attach your buyer broker agreement to the offer and say, dear Mr. Seller, as you can see, the consumer has, has agreed to pay me a 4% commission. They would like you to pay that on their behalf. Uh, are you willing to do this? And again, the seller is going to either accept or reject that offer. When you use this, what I'm calling the direct commission payment method, this doesn't count against financing concessions, and this is completely allowable on VA loans. All right, this is exactly how FISBOs work today. When you go to a FISBO and the FISBO agrees to pay you a commission, VA does not count that in the max 4% concession. VA allows the seller to pay a commission to whoever they want. Uh, so this doesn't hurt your financing in any way, but the con of this is it does expose the commission amount to the seller. Maybe you see, uh, maybe you talk to a listing agent and they say, my seller is not paying a dime of buyer's agent commission, so don't even ask me for it. Well, guess what? Option one is now off the table unless that person wants to reconsider. The second way is to ask for an overall buyer cost concession and then use part of that to pay your commission. So again, let's say you're doing an FHA deal where the max concession is 6%. You have a signed buyer broker agreement at 3%. The seller told you they're not paying any commission. You can still go in and say, hey, I'd like you to pay 6% toward my buyer's closing costs. And then your buyer can use three of that six to pay your buyer broker agreement and the other three to pay some of their closing costs. You may have to negotiate with the lender a little bit on junk fees or whatever, but this again gives you as a buyer's agent more flexibility in how you negotiate your compensation and then how you ultimately get the seller to pay that compensation. So the pro here is it doesn't expose the commission amount at the offer. So if the seller, for whatever reason, just does not want to pay buyer's agent commission, fine, make a seller concession instead, but you as the buyer's agent can still get paid. The con here is in this method, it would count against the financing of seller concession. So you have a choice. So now when you're going to make those offers, you can look at both sides of the coin and determine what's going to be best for you getting your buyer's offer accepted and earning the compensation that you already negotiated under your buyer broker agreement. Next slide. So when you're ready to submit an offer, personally, I wouldn't even call the listing agent to ask if the seller wants to pay any commission or if there's a pre-negotiated commission. I would just submit my offer, include my buyer broker agreement and say, hey, my buyer needs you to pay this amount. They don't have the funds. That's a part of our offer. You can't do this today because of rule, NAR rule 1616 because the commissions aren't already negotiated. Uh, and now you can only make what's in your buyer broker agreement. So to me, the, the offer of cooperative commission at this point is irrelevant. You've already agreed to a commission with your buyer. You have the right to ask the seller to pay that full amount. Why do you even care what the buyer broker, you know, co-op commission is? I wouldn't even ask. I would just submit my offer and, and make it part of the negotiations. Next slide. So the big question remains. We've seen this slide a couple of times. While an option, should you pre-negotiate a cooperative commission with your seller? 
the more we talk about this, the more we show you again. My goal here is to just expand your mind, expand your way of thinking. LPT is not here to tell you how to do this, how to run your business. We're here to support you with education. We're here to support you with recommendations. We're here to help you think bigger and think differently, but ultimately it is your choice as an entrepreneur. Next click. Uh, it's ultimately your choice as an entrepreneur uh, as to how you want to approach this. Next slide. There we go. LPT, age and choice. You are going to get to decide which of all these different methods you want to use. Are you going to pre-negotiate commission? Are you going to submit uh, under a, a request for direct commission payment? Are you going to submit under a closing cost concession? You as agents have all of these choices into how you're going to do business, and LPT is here to support you. Next slide. And I'm going to try to push this along because we're we're running a little slow. We're running a little behind on time. I hope you guys can stick with us. We're going to keep going. Uh, next slide, uh, real quick. I just, I just want to point out, like I've been down this road before. Back in 2013, I was in the mortgage business when TRID was first announced. TRID took effect in 2015. At the time, I saw a lot of mortgage companies fighting trade, looking for loopholes, trying to do it the old way. Myself and some other mortgage companies made a decision to embrace trade, to try to find the ways to help our clients and our company win under the new framework. And it was a massive win for me. It's a big part of how I created the company I created, created the wealth I had. And so I see an opportunity for us to do that together now here. Next slide. Uh, we actually, when we embraced TRID at the time, the industry was saying, oh, it's going to take 60 days, same type of nonsense media headlines. It's going to take 60 days to close a loan now. No one will ever get loans closed. Homes aren't going to happen. Uh, I closed the first trade loan in 10 days. It was such a big accomplishment. We hopped on a private jet, flew down to the closing. I attended the closing in person. My point here to you is embracing change for me was a massive part of my success. And that's why I'm talking to you today about how I envision your ability to embrace this change and create wins for yourself. Next slide. Uh, you'll notice four of the faces in this picture on the next slide. Uh, Steve Dickman, Lewis, and Matt Hodge were all on that jet with me 10 years ago when we flew down to celebrate that first trade closing. Uh, again, the leadership team here at LPT has been together for a long time. We've been through this together before. We've been through this in other industries, and we are here to help guide you through it and to help challenge you to think bigger and think of creative ways to create those wins. Next slide. Uh, at the time, forms were another big part of this. So when, when this all changed, the good faith estimate went away with TRID. The, the, the industry made up this new quote sheet, which is here's an example of one. It was a super ugly document. I made a decision to go a different direction. I'm a marketer. I decided to make good looking documents. Next slide. And this is something we're gonna do for you here at LPT. We're now gonna get into the tools that LPT is gonna create for you. Again, following the roadmap I used for trade a decade ago. So while the rest of the industry was using the documents on the left, my company was using the documents on the right. My picture, great graphics, still met all the regulatory requirements for, di for disclosing the information to the consumer, but it made us look good. It made people feel better about accepting the new information. And so we're going to take this again. This is stuff I did a decade ago to prepare RP funding for TRID. I'm now going to show you the previews of some tools that we've been working on to do this exact same thing for LPT agents so you can stand out when it comes to getting that buyer broker agreement signed. And you can stand out when it comes to getting that customer relationship up front so that they can do business with you. Next slide. Uh, one last, okay, I, I got a little ahead of myself. TRID forced my customer relationship to start with disclosure. Before that, we didn't have to get documents in people's hands at the very beginning. Mandatory broker agreements is doing the same thing. Our job at LPT is to make this as simple and effective as possible for both you and your consumer. And that's a responsibility we're going to take seriously as your broker. Make this as simple and effective and attractive as possible for you and your consumer to get through that new upfront buyer broker agreement and get committed to each other and do business. Next slide. All right, so the new LPT buyer broker agreement system is going to be customizable, easy and convenient, mobile friendly. You'll be able to deliver through email, SMS, or print. You know we love print. You can initiate from mobile and execute on mobile, and you as the agent will decide what level of information to include in that sales process, in that sales presentation to get your buyer broker agreement signed. Next slide. Now, you know this stuff's going to look good because you know everything at LPT is going to look good. Uh, a new home buyer packet. This is the new printed bound magazine. The buyer broker agreement will actually live in the back of this and be perforated. So you can give them the magazine, walk them through your value proposition, get that buyer broker agreement signed in person, and then tear the perforation out of the back, 
take a picture of it, upload it to LPT Connect, and you are ready to go. While everyone else is handing out ugly black and white forms, you are going to make a marketing presentation as a part of getting your buyer broker agreement signed so that your customer can understand your value and understand the benefit of working with you as an LPT agent at what is a difficult time getting a document signed up front. And we will customize the documents to be state compliant that are in the back of this magazine that can be torn out. Another way that LPT agents will have an unfair advantage and show up differently. Next slide. All right, as much as we love our print, we want to have an amazing online experience too. This online experience can be launched from inside of LPT Connect. It will be desktop or mobile friendly, and you as the agent will customize what that journey looks like to getting the consumer to sign the buyer broker agreement and reviewing your packet on a device. Next slide. So you'll see here on the left, there's a couple of different options. You decide which of those tabs are present. We've put some examples here. Why work with an LPT Realty agent? My pledge to you. Best practices for house hunting. Resources available to you. Buyer broker agreement. Privacy policy and broker disclosure. Signature. It's an easy to use wizard modeled after a TurboTax style integration that allows the consumer to go through this process in an understandable way that helps position you, create and show your value and give them access to easily sign the documents they need to be signed. Next slide. The cool thing here is you decide which of those tabs on the left actually show up. You may say, hey, you know what? I just wanna send the buyer broker agreement. I don't wanna do all the other stuff. No problem. You'll be able to set that setting inside of Connect. And when the link goes out to your buyer and the link can go out via text message, email, you decide how to deliver it, it's instant. And for some consumers, you may have them look at all of these resources. Other consumers, you may just put the buyer broker agreement in there and be done but they can e-sign it online inside of our system instantly. You guys can be doing this on a hood of a car. You can be doing it while you're driving to that first appointment. We are giving you the tools to put the buyer broker agreement and all other relevant information to build that initial relationship in the consumer's hands as absolutely easily as possible with a click of a few buttons inside of LPT Connect. Now, this was originally supposed to be part of LPT Connect 3.0, all right, we, we just announced LPT Connect 2.0 at our conference, which is all about connecting you to each other. We are actually already working on and planning 3.0 and 4.0 for release in the future. This buyer broker agreement system is one of the things that we were building into Connect 3.0 that we are bringing back now to launch as soon as possible to have it in your hands before the deadline of when these changes take effect. Really exciting system. We are not going to replace dot loop. We're still going to use dot loop for contracts, state specific documents. We are purely building this system for the initial point of contact, the initial sale, the initial disclosure, the initial buyer broker agreement. All right. So really exciting stuff coming out here. Next slide. So recap of that LPT connect buyer broker agreement system agent can easily launch a sales presentation with an included buyer broker agreement. You can update negotiable items in real time for the client. So if you send that, that, that out at 4% and the clients on the phone and says, Hey, I don't think four is fair. I think it should be three. You update three and connect, you press push. The client refreshes and boom, it's updated in real time. We are building a real time collaboration system for you to get your clients through this BB, this uh, buyer broker agreement process. Instant delivery via SMS, email, or you can hand it to them in print. Agent decides which screens are included in the flow and the software will allow the least friction possible for getting a buyer broker agreement signed. This is gonna be a huge advantage for LPT agents as these new changes come into play. Next slide. We're also launching buyer power tools, all right? We've had listing power tools for a long time. Listing power tools was all about positioning you on the listing side, which again is now more important than ever because agent consumers are more likely to try to negotiate more of the commission. Commission negotiation is now a hot topic. So having listing power tools is more important than ever, but we're also now bringing buyer power tools to the table, which will be more magazines, more collateral information, that integrated buyer broker agreement system in print, everything you need to show up like a rock star and win in the new world order. Uh, next, uh, <laughs> next slide. Uh, here's some other great views of that. Again, you guys know what our magazines look like. You know how impactful the printed collateral is. We are going to take that to the next level on the buy side because it is now more important than ever that you show maximum value to the buyer at that all important time when you're not asking them to commit to you through a buyer broker agreement. Next slide. 
Uh, there's going to be a new buyer box in development. I'm not going to talk too much about this today. Uh, it's probably going to have a tape measure with an LPT logo on it in it uh, and some other cool stuff. But again, we're looking at ways to give you that shock and awe box, that package that you can hand to a potential buyer as you are meeting with them before that first tour and getting that buyer broker agreement signed. We want to make sure that you have the absolute best tools to show up like no one else and win in a market that is shifting and changing. Next slide. So LPT Realty, your brokerage for life. Uh, we take less commission, which in the event that commissions do compress is going to be more important than ever. We are actually nimble and actually be able to bring information like this to you in 72 hours and already have amazing tools in the works that we can pull up a whole year in development path and get in your hands in time for this deadline. And my commitment to you is that LPT Realty will pioneer tools to help agents protect fair commission rates on listing and buying transactions and help you show up like no one else and win in absolutely any market. That's the end of my presentation. So last thing, again, how will you decide to proceed? 100% up to you as an agent. And now we're gonna throw it back for a little discussion with my two friends in the studio. Although we are way over time here. If, if you guys can stick around, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. But Lewis Hodge, let me get some reactions from you guys. Yeah, absolutely, man. So one, uh, you know, if you guys thought that we were just gonna be like, hey, here's the changes, we're gonna explain it. You already know that we're working on our end to do our part. And we talk about all the time is that the brokerage will always do our part to enhance our agents experience to make sure that you guys continue to go faster uh and so again you know we were thinking about these things over the weekend we knew this was coming uh, i don't think we thought it was going to kind of happen so early but we did but lewis i want to kind of get your thoughts we talked about this on real estate first friday actually just last week we were saying hey a big part of the you know that people neglect is we go to the listing presentation and we show up but on the buying side transactions, you know, we'll show up in flip flops. We're like, hey, here's the house, open the door. You know, there's not a lot of preparation there. And it's a massive opportunity that's missed. And while I know we went through a lot of information here, and there's a lot of additional questions. Uh, and just so you know, we will download the chat. We will uh, pull out all the questions and then we'll make those available for you inside of Connect. So if you didn't get your question answered, know that that's coming. But we talked about this specific thing about adding value at the time of your first interaction with the buyer's agent. So as you're kind of seeing this information, where, where does your mind take you when, you when you're looking at yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. So first, guys, uh, again, we cannot reiterate enough that there is a lot of information in today's Motivational Monday. Um, there, There is a lot of topics. We are just 72 hours into seeing the settlement, seeing the language that was proposed in the settlement. Keep in mind, um, as mentioned, the court still has to approve the settlement. Um, if there are any type of material modifications or denials of the settlement, there is a rescission period that takes place with the parties. So I believe that, you know, the settlement agreement will be approved by the court. More often than not, agreements of this nature do get approved. Um, the anticipated inaction date is around July of this year, so that's when we see it happen. Uh, but yeah, you know, ch change is scary. You know, as, as mentioned, you know, change can be a very scary thing. But one thing here at LPT Real Realty is that we are resilient. And when change happens, we are ready to embrace that change and to and come out the other end winning. You know, change creates opportunities. And one of the biggest opportunities that exists with this change that took place is on the buyer side of the equation. We have always been very prepared and had hard tools sharpened on the seller side. Yep. You know, how do we go? How do we show up to a listing presentation? How do we make ourselves unique when we are in front of that seller? This change has now unlocked that opportunity on the buyer side of the equation as well. And we know that here at LPT Realty, we are going to show up differently and we are going to show up unique and extract and e exploit that opportunity that has been created right. through these changes. Love it, man. I love it. Uh, so you kind of said some things just to, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when you're saying it's a proposed settlement, so while we believe that both parties have somewhat agreed to it, it hasn't been ratified, meaning a fully approved by, by the courts. And so when that happens, you're saying the effective date, should everything go through, would be around July. Yeah, that's, that's correct. There's still hearings that, need to be, that have to take place to enact the settlement agreement. Parties have to opt in to the settlement agreement. But if everything moves its course accordingly, I do believe around the July time frame is when when the changes will take into effect. Okay, awesome. Uh, one other thing I want to throw back to, if you guys saw that photo, that <laughs> that photo was so <laughs> funny. I remember when we flew down there for that first trade closing and all of the fear that was surrounding the industry at that time. It was going to be 60 days, 90 days. People were going to go bankrupt. And uh, Robert got it done. Like It was, what, 10 days was the first, first closing? Uh, and so I think the... 
the flight down to to the closing probably cost more than, than, than what you made on it. But I think it was 100 percent. No, no question. And <laughs> yeah. we were celebrating a milestone. We were proving a point that the industry was screaming the sky is falling and, and we turned it into an absolute win. And uh, you know, again, I, there's always opportunity to win. And and again, here at LPT, we're focused on making sure we we find those opportunities, we maximize those opportunities for our agents. Uh, that that's that's the role a brokerage should play. You know, we're we're not we are not here to find you customers. We are not here to do a lot of things that you as an entrepreneur have to do. But these are the types of places where a brokerage, in my mind, has a responsibility to help its agents by empowering your real estate business at a higher level. And we do that with marketing. We will do that with guidance. We will do that with training. We're going to do that with Connect 2.0. We will continue to rise to the occasion. That's just, it's who LPT is, man. It's it's why we're here. It's why we're different. It's why we've grown faster than anyone in history ever has before. And why we'll continue to win and change this industry because we will we will always cast off the old ways and look for ways to help our agents win. That's right, man. I love it. I love it. Well, we are probably just a little bit over time, but uh, again, guys, want to just make sure that you guys know we will download the chat and all the questions. We will make that available on a frequently asked questions uh, inside of Connect for you and within the next, I'm sorry, inside of our knowledge base within the next couple of days. Um, so if you didn't get your question answered, and we know there's still a lot of questions. We gave you a lot of information today just so that you've got the, the talk track as because we know that your consumers and the people who you're serving, I mean, how many text messages have we all received of people being like, hey, are you guys going to be okay? What's going to be happening? You know, people are concerned for you or they're concerned about themselves. And so the conversations are going to be flowing out there. So we want to give you some early information to help you be armed in those conversations but as we get closer to that that uh, deadline or that change point we will make sure that we have all these tools in place we'll have ample training we'll be talking about these things on real estate first Fridays and strategies on how to engage when those first kind of initial conversations as you're explaining it um, it's going to be new, right? So the first couple of times you explain it, you're going to stumble over your words. My recommendation is that you talk about it with each other, you know, practice with each other about how it's going to work. Talk about strategies. We are faster and we win when we go together. Um, and so that would be my recommendation. But I know we're kind of at time. So, uh, Lewis, I want to turn it over to you. Any final words for you before we turn it to, to Robert? Yeah, so as these changes are coming into fruition, you know, one of the biggest things that we can work on is this whole notion of a buyer audition. This is a new element in our business that will be existing and we will be carving out time on Real Estate First Friday to go through different strategies and tactics on how to most effectively position yourself during those buyer auditions that will be happening here in the future. That's right, man. Awesome. We're looking forward to uh, what that brings over the next couple of months and, and growing with our agents. Uh, so, Robert, you went through a lot of information today. I know you crunched. Some of this was somewhat prepared because you knew it was coming. Uh, and, you know, I think Matt Levy, our chief strategy officer, always kind of says this phrase, like, Robert has this weird ability to look around corners and kind of see what's happening. And I remember when we first launched Listing Power Tools and, and LPT Realty, it was into a time where no one could really see why it was happening I mean, we trusted that you were you had something but you're like hey man i think that the market was right and you were looking for specific things and so for people who have been on the journey with us now they get to see further and further of why you did it at that time what was coming and i think it builds a lot more credibility into your ability to navigate these waters and help our agents navigate these waters but what are your kind of final thoughts and what should we be thinking about as we're going into this week yeah, look, I, I think this could have been a, a real problem for our industry. If you look at the lawsuit, you know, again, when the lawsuit was filed before we started OPC Realty. We knew this was on the horizon. We'd, we'd been thinking about what a new world would look like. You know, we've read the DOJ stuff. We've read all the briefings. Like, I, I read everything I can get my hands on. I think that helps shape some of that ability to kind of see around corners, as Levy calls it. But, you know, I, this really was a good outcome for us as an industry. And I think I think some things were right in here. Uh, again, we we can all, you know, we can wish that it wasn't going to happen. We can wish that things were back the old way. Uh, that was not going to happen. The writing was on the wall that changes were going to come to our industry. And if there had to be changes, uh, I, I think these these are changes we can live with. These are changes that I think we can survive within as an industry. Uh, I'm proud to lead 10,000 amazing entrepreneurs through this journey uh, and, and be able to draw from my past experiences and draw from our amazing technology and the great team we built here to put you all in a position to win. Because that, again, that's what it's all about. That's our job as your brokerage is to help put you in a position to win as an entrepreneur. And we take that seriously. Uh, so again, really, really great to join everyone here today, share this information. We'll get everything posted online. We'll read through the chat and bring more knowledge next Monday. Uh, one more congratulations to Natalie Cox and our other new state brokers. 
uh, brokerage for life. You know, we're, we're here to win at every turn. We're here to give LPT agents that unfair advantage, give you amazing marketing tools, give you agent choice, give you an online connected community. Like we will just keep bringing, we're going to keep bringing the fire at every chance. Uh, every time there is, there is something to overcome. You know, we, we joke a lot about this ability to turn lemons into lemonade Hodge. And you know, the, when the industry handed me lemons in 2007, when I lost my job and I launched RP funding and then with trade in 2015, and now with this settlement, like you, you give me lemons and all I see is a lemonade recipe. And I'm excited to make lemonade with the amazing 10,000 uh, entrepreneurs here at LBT Realty. So go out there, have a great week, ignore the noise, you know, don't bury your head in the sand, recognize that change is coming and we have to be prepared for change, but the sky is not falling. Uh, ignore the noise, focus on your business, know that we have your back and we will be bringing more training, more tools uh, and more benefits for our LPT agents to win in this new market. So have a great week, everybody.